Oh, hey, we're live. Hey, we are live. Calling Chris Anderson in London, 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 London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Hi, how you doing? I'm here, believe it or uh, not. I, I know, I saw you. You were busy, like, enjoying the winter wonderland there. I, are you kidding me? Absolutely. Look this at that, is, picture at the ready. This is Chicago this morning, uh, out uh, in Grant Park. You can see some of the buildings there in the distance. It's uh, pretty right. awesome. We've had about a foot of snow in the last 18 hours. Wow. So but I'm a happy, to... happy guy. I, you're a happy guy. Happy guy. Love the snow. Love the snow. And, uh, and I'm happy that people are joining us. Uh, Xavier tells us that they're having elections for the cattle in Parliament, and he is skipping the debate on TV to watch History Happy Hour instead. All right, Xavier, so, next week we want a full report. Next week we get Valerie coming to us from Normandy. We have Doug McCord with a, one of his fantastic facts about Pennsylvania. Uh, many, many other folks. Neil says, can you hear me? No, Neil, we cannot. So, <laughs> so um, we, uh, uh, we are so pleased to have a, a crowd of folks joining us again for yeah. another History Happy Hour. And I want to remind everybody that we're here talking about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. And all of our programs are archived on the Stephen Ambrose uh, History Happy Hour webpage. So there's lots of ways to watch the 44 shows that we have wow. done before this one. Creeping up on us. It is creeping up on us. So I think I've stalled long enough, Chris. Do you think we can uh, go here for uh, for the big open? I think it's time. All right. <laughs> is open the bar is open and mr anderson the floor is yours well well you know it's going to come as no great surprise uh to you that we our guest tonight uh far surpasses us in output and ability uh, <laughs> <laughs> dr helen fry is um an expert on the uh germans who fled nazi germany uh before the war and came to britain and served um in the British forces during World War II, and also all manner of uh, intelligence operations. She is the author of uh, 25 books, so just a few more than you or I. Um, and I first, this is just a scotch, as my wife says. Yeah. Um, but I first became aware of Dr. Fry. I went to one of her lectures at the National Army Museum. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture about um, German Jewish refugees making their way to Britain and their contribution to the war effort. Then after the lecture, I picked up a book uh, called The Walls Have Ears. And uh, there you go. Um, and it really kind of just kind of blew me away. Um, I like to think I'm pretty well read about the war. And this is something that uh, just sort of totally slipped my mind. So uh, this will be our topic for tonight. It's fascinating. And I also want to add that since then, she's gone on to write a book, a published book called MI9, which came out this year. So The Walls Have Years came out in 2019. Um, and then MI19, MI9 this year. So. And, and we are having perhaps a bit of a technical problem with Helen, but um, who uh, either that or she turned into an alien. But Helen, can you hear us? We can't see you very well, but can you hear us? Oh, I and, seem to have disappeared, but good evening or good day, everyone. If Good you day. Can't hear me, oh. I will just. Can you hear me? We can, we can hear, you. hear you fine. Can you hear us? It's a it's an exciting uh, it's an exciting time here on History Happy Hour. So, Helen Fry, do you hear us at all? And that sounds like. Do not, you know, guys, not... what I'm going to do? I'm going to move my computer. It will take me all of three or four minutes. I do apologize to everyone, but I really can't hear you. It's lagging very badly, and I don't want to ruin your show. <laughs> so I'll be no, two no. or three minutes, and I'll be back in. Excellent. That's fine. We yeah? look forward to it. Yes, thank you. And uh, so, Chris, I have to say, we have talked about this fact that um, we have never, we, in 45 weeks, we never... Um, have a situation where the guest hasn't been able to get through, so we never have a backup. <laughs> so I would say to people, you, this is when your song and dance routine begins. Well, I was going to ask our audience, what what do you think our backup should be in this situation when the guest uh, 
the guest is not, uh, we're having a technical problem, we're primed and ready to talk about the topic, and both of us know kind of enough that we could stumble our way through it, so would you stumble your way through it in that circumstance, or would we immediately start talking about Easy Company? Uh, you know, I, I or, haven't even or is there a third choice? <laughs> Well, we could do a poll about who, what would they rather have us talk about, Easy Company or the Ghost Star? Maybe we could see who. Oh no, there. no, we're not going there because uh, it's all oh, going to be Easy Company. Oh, and it's, it's, oh. a, it's no, no problem. So, uh, as people are just joining us, because we still have people just joining us, our guest is having just a slight technical issue, and uh, she expects to rejoin us in a couple of minutes, and we are stalling madly. So, Thomas <laughs> says we should talk about your favorite tours. Oh, yours, I, Rick, of well, course, I, is my favorite. Well, I, I only do two tours, which is the Ghost Army Tour and the Revolutionary War Tour. And since mm -hmm. we haven't actually done a Revolutionary War Tour yet, the first one is scheduled in August, um, I have to say the Ghost Army is currently my favorite one. <laughs> uh, and Ted wants to know, can, you dazzle, can Chris dazzle us with any British accent he's picked up since he moved there? I think this is going to lose us a lot of viewers right away, but go for it, Chris. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, you would like me to say something, but I won't. Not even a try. <laughs> Not even a try. What do you oh, think? Wait, wait, wait. I could yeah. say, computer says no. Let's see, who, who that is that one? just lost on me. Yeah. Well, yeah, where's that right. from? I don't know. Little Britain. Okay. I did watch a movie uh, last night set in did you? with a historical theme. You it's did? Called, it's called The Dig. Has anyone seen The Dig? We've heard about that. We're it's on Netflix. Yeah. And it is a, um, it is a movie about uh, an archaeological dig, true story, that takes place, the Sutton Hoo dig, that takes place on the eve of World War II in uh, 1939. Literally, I mean, on the eve on uh, the days in the last few weeks before and it is perhaps the most impressive archaeological discovery in British history. So All right, but no cool spoiler alerts. Yes. Well, I don't think I've I, everything I've said is already in the in the trailer. Okay, uh, so Kim, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say Kim, uh status of 2021 tours uh as far as we know is that um we're hoping to do them. Um and a lot of it depends on uh, vaccine rolls out and governments allowing travel um, but based on what we've been told everything um, from Ambrose tours standpoint is a go we're just waiting for the green light from airlines and governments yes so. and uh, and obviously it, it's uh, it's probably as the year goes on it gets uh, it gets you know more and more likely that tours will go on so um, you know the earliest ones may, and we don't we don't know for a fact what's going on. But the earliest ones are probably more at risk of being moved or adjusted somehow than the than the later ones are. So um, that's the answer on that one. <clears throat> and um, oh, Michael's telling us is about his uh, bike riding in uh, Montana. So we are we are we are really and, and our audience is going up. This is what's really scary, Chris, <laughs> is, is that our audience is rising as we're doing this. Um, but, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we could, someone asked if we could talk about why we, we like this book. I yeah, mean, absolutely. I, yeah, I, why, go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that well, hopefully we'll get a chance to hear, you know, from the author, but um, I. I'd like to think I, I've read quite a bit about World War II, and I know a fair bit about what happened. And um, I read about this book. It's the story of a special intelligence gathering operation that the British had set up. Um, and I, I knew nothing about it, and it totally blew me away. Um, and hopefully we're going to have a chance. Oh, oh. oh we're getting... Hey! We're trying to bring in Helen, who's now backstage. You have this, it's a great look, Helen. You're backstage at the Emmys or something. It's like the green screen. I am. Um, can you hear us? Yes, it's absolutely fine. I do apologize for Not wrecking all. your show. It, it, Stop, it, no. I, we, we have, uh, you know, our audience is delighted that you're here, and they've really enjoyed seeing us desperately try to vamp <laughs> for five minutes. They've had a wonderful experience, but I think that they're really happy it's over. Yes. So, Chris had just given you a bang-up introduction. I don't know if you heard it, but you were you were you were in the stars as in twenty-five books and the whole thing. But Chris, start us off with a first question. 
Well, I, I, my first question, Helen, is like I was, I was I was explaining as you were getting ready to join us again. Um, I'd never really heard about this story, and um, mm -hmm. I'd like you to kind of explain to our viewers what the book is about um, and how you came came on the story. Yeah, so it's always, I suppose, with many intelligent stories, quite often just by chance, chance meeting with a veteran. And you mentioned at the beginning that I've been doing some research on the 10,000 Jews who fought, German Jews and Austrians who fought for Britain during the Second World War. And very quickly you discover that many of them got taken up for intelligence work. And I've known for a number of years a particular veteran, Fritz Lustig, and he said to me, you know, I wanted to fight on the front line. He was originally born in Berlin, a German Jew. I wanted to fight in the front line. I was never given the chance. He said, instead, I was stuck in Buckinghamshire with these headphones on. And he said, did we do anything that made any difference to the outcome of the war? We were listening in to the conversations of German prisoners of war. And he said, we were told by the commanding officer, Kendrick, that what we were doing was as important as fighting on the front line or firing a gun in action. And he said, but we, we kind of didn't really get a sense of that. And of course, at the end of the war, this wall of silence, and he was left with that question 65 years later when I first met him, 60, 65 years later. So I promised him I would tell the story and that's where I uncovered this incredible story. No one had told the British side of the story of the intelligence personnel and secret listeners like Fritz Lustig. So I kept my promise to yes, you did. Him and waded through thousands, tens of thousands of files for about over 15 years. But it was worth it. Absolutely. So this is an operation. I mean, I, I, I think the part that I'm most interested in we'll get to shortly, which is sort of the bugging of the of the German generals who are captured mm -hmm. German generals. But that's part of a bigger operation, right? A, a sort of an intelligence gathering operation with German prisoners that that starts. And I, you can kind of give us the overview of it. It, it starts actually in uh, in Tower of London, which is a wonderful. If it was a movie, you couldn't make that up, right? So. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know, and often the story comes in a bit later and people know about the later part of the story at the other sites. But yeah, I uncovered this amazing fact that this fortress or, you know, one of our biggest tourist attractions in London was actually used from the outbreak of war. You know, the day that Poland was invaded, Kendrick turns up at the Tower of London to open his unit and it's not very long actually before the first german prisoners start arriving and that for me was extraordinary because this is a a very small beginning he had just six staff air navy and army intelligence and we already had 60 german prisoners of war as you will have read in the tower of london within about three weeks of the outbreak of war mostly u-boat crew at that point of course and then a few weeks later you got shot down Luftwaffe pilots and it very quickly ramps up and across the wartime becomes what I've described actually as an industrial scale intelligence operation and you just think if you took away all the knowledge of what was gained from those prisoners of war and they were all ranks obviously not the generals yet they weren't captured until North Africa but uh, you know you could legitimately ask the question could we have won the war and it is extraordinary the stuff we are beginning to pick up yeah. And the, so, the, the the generals are are uh, of course they're they're not on the front line. That's why they're not captured first, right? They're like you boys be on the front line. We'll we'll stay back or we'll get there eventually. And Chris, just as a housekeeping, is your power still plugged in there? Or? Oh yeah, my um, yeah. yeah, take it. Yeah, that will help. Yeah, there we go. And uh, so go ahead. Sorry. So 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 just um, we'll get into this, but a lot of this is we talk about. Um, these German generals that are held at this British country estate. And I should tell the the viewers that this isn't Stalag 13, okay? This isn't Hogan's Heroes. I want to read a quote uh, from the book. It says, Instead, the generals found themselves living a life of relative luxury at, they believed, the generous behest of the king, and according to their status as military commanders. And this played right into their sense of self-importance. 
Their every need was catered for, and they began to relax into their surroundings. Trent Park could be likened to a traditional, privileged, and exclusive gentleman's club in central London. So, um, you know, this isn't... When I think of, you know, German prisoners, you know, or, or I think of, like, you know, the Gestapo guys with lights and eyes and mm -hmm. the whole... They had it pretty good, and this was a deliberate kind of ploy by the British. How did that idea come about of how to treat these guys well it really is the brain well not the brain child but the genius of commander kendrick thomas joseph kendrick who'd already spent nearly 30 years working for sis or some form of intelligence before sis was founded so he had a lot of experience from just after the boer war and so he really is the the man that brings this to its success he has the vision i mean obviously he has a whole team working with him but it what i discovered was a lot of it is about psychology and you mentioned yes you're quite right you know hold them in stalag look three or 13 or whatever yeah. or flag four whatever you're cold it's as our prisoners were but it's really the equivalent to german prisoners in particular the generals in nissen huts with barbed wire they're going to behave like prisoners of war so we've got Hitler's top commanders, first captured in the battlefields of North Africa. By the end of the war, we've got a staggering nearly 100 senior commanders in that house. You cannot waste that opportunity from an intelligence point of view. So it's right. really, there. Yeah, there they are, arriving. But look, they're saluting. And it's right. kind of everything against what we would think of. You were quite right when you said that about prisoners of war. And it doesn't matter what rank they were. They were treated well, but of course at Trent Park they were treated extra specially well. They yeah. believed the king had given them Trent Park. There they are relaxed in the grounds, looking incredibly happy. And what I discovered, because I was expecting after my conversation with Fritz, and you know we, we worked together very closely for a number of years, right up until he passed away a couple of years ago, um, I was expecting to use the bug conversations, which I did, but I uncovered all these intelligence reports which give us the daily life of the antics. And what you find is this whole dramatic stage set is in is going on in the house. The generals have just walked into it. They don't realise that everything is a masquerade, really. They think they're running the show and we allow them to do it. Right. You know, they're strutting around. The casual general, when he comes off the battlefield, forgets and does a Nazi salute. Others are arguing. And, yeah, we just allowed them to get on with it because they didn't realise, of course, everywhere was mic'd. You know, the bugging devices were hidden wherever well, I, they could be hidden. I love, I love those, the, the transcriptions that you have in the book where it has these German generals coming back after being questioned. It's like, oh, these English are too stupid. They don't even know yeah. what they're doing. And meanwhile, they're taking everything down. Um, and it, it, it's psychology again, you see. It's giving them a source for phony interrogation, if you want to call it that. Well, it's called interrogation, but it's really more of a sort of debriefing, friendly chat. And sometimes it was done at two of the other sites. Um, not the generals from North Africa, but later when there were lots of generals coming up, particularly after D-Day, and swathes of these top commanders. And they arrive first at Latimer House or Wilton Park in um, Buckinghamshire, so not that far from London. And they get their debriefing, the friendly chat around the grounds, and then they and they think they know what's happening. They think, oh, you know, they're trying to get some information out of us, and they're well treated. And then they're transferred to Trent Park and just sort of left alone. And they think their war is over. They think yeah. <laughs> they're there for two or three years in some cases, and they just completely relax. And they're not what? stupid, of course. They're highly, most of them are highly educated, right. top commanders that have fought in the First World War. But, you know, they're not thinking. It's all I think about psychology. That's my analysis. Yeah. So, the, so what we have, um, in essence, and, and Chris said uh, it's, it's not Hogan's Heroes, and that was a TV show, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, in the United States with... Uh, American who, prisoners of war in in uh, in Germany who are really actually running a whole incredible operation under the nose of the of the German uh, uh, 
Prison Camp Commander. Ridiculous, silly series that many of us still love, nonetheless. <laughs> and, um, Careful, yeah, don't take that too far. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh, but there is this element of, um, of, of, of fakery or showmanship here. You, they've brought the Germans to this, this country house, this Trent Park, this country house. They've given them nice rooms. They all have their their uh, their aide de camps, their Batman, yes. as they, as yes. they call them. They are given nice meals, maybe not as nice as they'd like as German generals. They are taken on excursions to London once in a while. Hey, would you like to go on a trip to London? So they're doing all this, and meantime, they they've got a a whole um, uh, incredible number of people in the in the basement, essentially in the M room, in the recording room, they are recording every single word in the dining room, the bedroom, yeah. the, the whole thing. It is, it is really an incredible operation. And there's even um, um, a, a, a fake lord involved in this. I mean, they've got other fake things and they've got a, didn't they have enough real lords? I don't know, but they have a <laughs> fake lord that they, they bring in for this. Oh, I love the fake lord. Because, you know, Kendrick and the intelligence chiefs, they were sort of chatting one day with the generals arriving and said, well, you know, I think to soften them up a bit more, we think it'd be a good idea for them to have, you know, a welfare officer. So the director of military intelligence says, oh, yes, yeah, so what sort of major? Um, no, 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 says Kendrick. Uh, the generals love an aristocrat. And so they created Lord Aberfeldy, and the name is no coincidence. I don't know if anyone's cottoned on, but of course, Aberfeldy is a whiskey distillery. <laughs> so they named him after a whiskey distillery, which is just typical humour of the intelligence service, I think, that shot through this whole story. And he befriends them. And of course, we're picking up from the microphones what they think of him. And they think, you know, oh, he's kind of secretly, well, he's not really Nazi, they say, but he's very sympathetic towards us. And I think he's on our side. And he's got, did he show you the photograph of the castle? Oh, yes, his castle in Scotland. It's all complete nonsense. <laughs> and and when, when he went, he took the occasional two or three generals, uh, a smaller group to some of the clubs in central London, some of the drinking, you know, and even our aristocrats didn't realise he was fake. And he was a senior intelligence officer, Ian Munro. I just love it. He was quite young, actually. He was only in his mid-twenties. But again, he did have a wooden leg, and that was, and you've read that in the book, another, you know, <laughs> trick. He would sort of hobble after a while, walking around the grounds, hobble to the seat in the front of the guards. I've got to sit down, you know, it's gammy leg. And they would sit there because the seat was, was mic'd. I didn't have to <laughs> bug a seat. <laughs> and the trees, of course, you pick that up. The trees in the garden, again, that's... Um, everything, the pool table. The pool table's bugged outside yeah. the window. Everything is bugged. You to work uh, that out. <laughs> so, and it's all wired back, as you say, to this secret area in the basement. And the German, German generals don't know. So, so this is, I mean... It's, it is very humorous, um, but it's also very serious. Yeah. And and John has asked, and I was going to ask you, can you talk about some of the areas in particular where the intelligence gained was so important or so effective? Yes, absolutely. And when I started out on this, people said, oh, she's banging on about this being as important as the you know code-breaking at Bletchley Park. But actually now um, it has been recognized as such. And the reason... It is, yeah. um, what we need, this is my precursor to what I'm going to say, we need our historians now to start looking at the volumes of intelligence because you get a sheer sense that this has impacted on the Battle of the Atlantic. The stuff in there I've never read before. Stuff on the Dieppe raid, although it was a failed raid. But for me, I give, always give one example. It's one in the book where I trace for the first time the direct link between the bugged conversations and as we've picked up about secret weapon in the Tower of London, but we don't quite know what it is. But by, of course, by early 43, we've got stuff coming out from agents behind enemy lines. We need to corroborate it. We haven't really taken it seriously. We're not too sure. The RAF had flown over the site Pennymunda on the North German coast in 1942. And it wasn't really possible to tell from those photographs what was going on there. And as you will have read, I trace a link between the conversations in March 1943, the first of which actually 
was at Latimer House, the paratrooper. And now we're kind of on alert. And they're talking about ramps and rockets. And then 10 days later, the generals at Trent Park are talking, you know, about losing the war. They're very depressed. Kendrick writes, you know, our guests are gloomy because of the fall of Stalingrad. They'd had delayed news of that. And ultimately, um, they thought they'd lost. And it's General Fontoma who says to one of the other unnamed generals, no, we haven't. We've got the secret weapon. What do you mean? And then very quickly, they start to talk about that. And so I do trace, they mean the V1, the V2, and then they start to talk actually about Penimunda. And there is a direct line between that and the bombing of Penimunda in August 43. That's without a shadow of a doubt now. And I do the paper trail for that. And it, what I have now come across a reference which describes this piece of intelligence from the bugged conversations as being the closest to war winning intelligence we will ever get. And I thought, yes. You're right. <laughs> and that was, <laughs> it's going to be a great moment, right? Movie. When you find something like that. I mean, honestly, I've never seen a reference like that. They said, this is the closest we will ever get to war winning intelligence. And I would just finish this little bit by saying. Um, I guess it is obvious. And people are probably thinking, in mind, well, it didn't stop the V1s. No, it didn't. And we were always racing to get the mobile launch sites again, from partly from bug conversations. But it meant the first V1 didn't land on London until the um, what was it, 13th of June, 1944. Yeah. So about a week after D-Day. Well, what if we hadn't discovered it in time? Right. You know, what if we hadn't? Well, and I, you know, I would just add, I don't want to, like, give too much away, John, but, I mean, she also talks about huge impact on the Battle of the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, um, intelligence about um, operations in 1944 that don't don't get acted upon, Operation yeah. Market Garden, for example, but the contribution is huge. Um, and one of the things that you also kind of allude to that I, I'd like you to maybe expand a bit on is, Trent Park uh, and this operation, they're uh, they're working with Bletchley. These aren't two yes. disconnected things. How are they working together? So that's something which, <clears throat> again, I discovered for the first time, and it takes years and years. Um, so there was a very early version of the book to come out uh, in, in Fritz's lifetime, but fortunately he saw the second book, the version to more in-depth research. Because, of course, bringing out the first version about eight or nine years ago meant that people came out of the woodwork, etc., etc. And yeah, you're absolutely right that this stuff impacted is as early as 1940. It takes a while for the stuff to come out of the woodwork. But yeah, pieced it together. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, and um, there's also, um, and again, without giving everything away, there's stuff there that affects the, the, uh, the, the Battle of Britain, essentially, the, uh, the efforts to... to uh, fight off there's a lot of tech tech stuff right uh the, the, yeah. the is a big part of the of of you know as opposed to our this unit's going to go here or this year but it's what's been developed that the generals have been clued into that 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 the british don't know about yet yes and it's not only um air stuff of course but you mentioned bletchley what we needed as well was stuff on enigma and okay. I'm so bold as to say, and this is my hunch, and it'd be nice for historians to corroborate this, we are picking up stuff on Naval Enigma in Jan early January 1940, of which Bletchley is involved, and we're sending personnel up to Bletchley um, saying, basically, what do you need to know? And by 43, we are facilitating Bletchley Park in interrogations, because they also need to find out, you know, what we're doing. And so I get a feeling that one of the first codes were broken with the help of Trent Park. But I need some sort of tech experts to kind of corroborate what I've written about that in the book, but it's really clear. And it's in one of the hut histories of Bletchley Park. So there's that, but you're absolutely right. The discovery of technology on the new, new technology on the aircraft, German aircraft, known as Ex-Gerrit Knichbein, Battle of the Beams, if people know about the Battle right, of the Beams. Right. That, was said later that without that discovery, we would have lost the Battle of Britain. Well, and Helen, you also make a mention in the book about one of the, the U-boat uh, officers that's being interrogated says, oh yeah, we have this Enigma machine and you use these rotors and 
Yeah. So he's actually explaining how this thing is, this machine that was so famous now actually works. Yeah, right. I mean, when I saw that in the files, you know, you kind of your eyes pop out. You, think, Am I, you know, you have to reread it and, and question, am I interpreting this correctly? And it is absolutely clear, and this is early, as you say, it's January, again, January 1940, one of our naval interrogators is boasting about our naval codes and their unbreakable, all this kind of stuff. Because he knows the German prisoner he's talking to is not going to escape. At this point, this guy's still in the Tower of London, this particular prisoner. Right. So he knows he's never... <laughs> so he can tell him a few bits. Of course, he boasts back. And they bef he befriends... Pennell befriends him. And this guy, May, actually starts writing down how the Enigma Code works. And you're right, the rotors. And I just find it extraordinary... Yeah. And that again appears in then in the Bletchley Park history that this piece of intelligence actually helped with the naval and cracking of the naval enigma because it gave Alan Turing and the others an opportunity to go wow. back and look at some stuff that they'd been looking at in 1938. So, you know, the two were working very, very closely for the duration of the war, and I find that exciting too. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, so viewers of this show know that uh, I have a special interest in in uh, the Ghost Army, and which is an American <laughs> an American Army unit that did uh, battlefield deception in uh, in World War Two. Did twenty one different battlefield deceptions. Uh, not as important a part of World War Two as as Trent Park certainly. But mm -hmm. the thing that struck me as being in common is that these are two stories that are both declassified in essentially right around the turn of the century, right around 2000. And yes. uh, with more coming out on each one uh, in the succeeding years. And that the, the thing is that the, uh, for many historians, you know, the, the, the picture, they already have a mental map of World War II from all the books that have been written. And neither of these stories is on it. So essentially what you, what you have to do is ask people to kind of go back and look at this history again, this... Yeah this World War II and say, maybe, you know, we need to do more research and figure out how important is this thing really, which can be a hard thing to do, right? Because historians, if they think of it one way, you're asking them to know you got to look at it a different way. And that, that seems like it's, it, it can be a challenge to get people to accept essentially new history. Well, it is interesting. And I will say this at this point, that there are books. I don't know if you spotted those. A, yeah, there are books coming out. Um, on all sorts of things, on the Bismarck, and still mm. on DF, on Norway, and no one's looked at the prisoners that we've captured in that period, and they could be lower ranked prisoners, but they are all giving up vital intelligence. And I really believe that a study of your right, the ghost army stories, uh, the bugging operation, for example, I think is going to change our understanding of the Second World War. Because I was interviewed not so long ago, within the last few weeks, and someone was tracing, going back to Penny Mundra and the V1, V2, said that the intelligence came out of one of the prisoner of war camps in Germany. And that's why we bombed Penny Mundra. It's not true, but that's the inherited tradition. And, and there's no, mm. that's why they would, why wouldn't they say that? But, you know, it is changing our understanding. And I think also the other thing that came out of this research for me, I was told that in intelligence circles, Without Bletchley Park and these, the bugging unit across Kendrick's three sites, we could have lost the war as late as February 1945. And I found that shocking, even though we're into Germany. And the reason was because Germany could have won the tech war. So it's going back to what you said about the tech. So it's not just, of course, as we said, 1940. It's not just 43 with the V1, V2. We are picking up tons and tons of stuff on tech. And one of the reports at the end of the war says that 95% of what we knew about German night fighter tactics and German radar comes solely from the bugged conversations. Oh. And again, I find that extraordinary. So if you take away that intelligence, I begin to wonder the impact on the war, well, it doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah. I mean, it's interconnected, of course, with all the others, but this is such an important story 
and it will change our understanding of the Second World War, I think. Well, I, you know, so getting kind of to the, the nitty gritty of it, um, this should come as no surprise to our viewers, but I'm a German general. And as soon as I hear a shot fired in anger, my hands go up like this. How do I go from this to having Savile Row suits made for me at Trent Park? And then, by, by tailors from Savile Row. It has to be Savile Row. Absolutely. I was. I, I wouldn't turn myself if I got a free suit from Savile Row, you know. No, no, it can't be any tailor. It has to be from Savile Row. It's, it's their <laughs> sense of self-importance. Their vanity so, is amazing. So depending on where they're captured, sometimes they're flown to Britain, sometimes they come by sea. And in my book, you can read, probably actually it might even be in a footnote. So I will forgive <laughs> that you haven't read my thousand footnotes. But yeah, some of them come via Plymouth, some of them through Hendon Aerodrome, which is now the RAF Museum at Hendon, yeah. North London. So that's that's an interesting connection there. And we have photographs of the generals in particular arriving there. We do think also that some prisoners could well, there are occasional reference to them arriving at Bovingdon Aerodrome, which was a couple of miles north of Latimer, Latimer okay. House in Buckinghamshire. <clears throat> So, and, yeah, so then they're transferred. Sometimes, as I said earlier, they'll come through Latimer House and Wilson Park, particularly if the house is full at Trent Park. <laughs> and right. then they have to decide what they're going to do. So the generals have to share bedrooms, and that causes heck of a yes. <laughs> And then, no way, you're not going to... I would never share time. a bedroom if I were a general, no. Yes, I love the, the story. So, oh, yeah, they, they threaten to move their furniture into the hall, to sleep on the stairs. And Lord Aberfeldy says to him, bless him, you can't help chuckling in the archives, says to him, gentlemen, very seriously, gentlemen, you may sleep on the stairs, <laughs> you may sleep in the hallway, but you are not to move a single bed from your bedrooms. His <laughs> 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 it's, it's bed's being moved out into the corridor. It's just crazy, crazy nuts. And the bedrooms were bugged. They were he Two of them were heavily bugged, a metre apart. Wow. So I not discover any of them. And Rick is a sneaky guy, so he's in the basement listening to all of my conversations. Yes, I am. And writing reports about me. Is that how? No, it's recorded on special oh, okay. equipment. Right, right. And well, I... well, I wanted to ask about the recording. So they're recording this, and they basically they would listen to all the mics and then say, oh, this conversation is good, we're going to record it. And my understanding from reading the book, um, even though I didn't look at the 1,000 footnotes, is that, um, I'm sure Chris did, is that they recorded it on uh, uh, transcription discs, on, on uh, phonograph discs, essentially, like you would, like they did recording hit records in the, in the 1940s. On 78, yes. Yes. Um, and which I thought was interesting. They, they didn't, did they ever switch over to wire recorders, which was a technology developing at the time? Or no, they, they kept it. Uh, on these 78s so are they still around someplace we hope so i mean they've never been found they were never found for a documentary i do have one person who reckons they have got one but i haven't seen it yet and it's a reliable trusted source so i'm yeah. hoping one day but of course they could well have deteriorated it might not be possible to hear Anymore. Oh, it's believe me that that, <laughs> the, that technology is a wonderful technology because it doesn't deteriorate. And uh, oh, okay, this is another thing I'm... we have in common with the Ghost Army because we've got uh, oh, sound oh, effects seventy eights and we want to find them. Ghost Army, mm. yeah, yes, Ghost it. Army. Well, we had to. I, I want to raise another topic area, and we've had uh, uh, Xavier's been uh, asking about this, and I'll, I want to bring it up. Um, uh, uh, and that's the Holocaust. What yeah. did we learn? What did the British learn about the Holocaust from this? And sort of what does it tell us about both what the what German army knew, because they always say, well, we don't really know about this. Um, and then what the British actually knew and when from Trent Park. Yeah. So Kendrick writes in 1940, most prisoners speak about atrocities. And that's one of the... I suppose revelations really because you are expecting to overhear military stuff of course and, and stuff you know air intelligence stuff but yeah we are listening to everything and so from as early as 1940 right the way through to the end of the war we are amassing and they kept evidence of the war crimes and we're picking up what I found incredibly shocking details so it isn't just you know oh we've shot three and a half thousand jews horrendous as that is it's actually they actually talk about how they did it and some of it some of it that comes out of one of the sister sites is is 
stuff I've never read before about concentration camps, particularly even some of the medical experimentation stuff. Mm. That we don't pick up at Trent Park, but we do at one of the other sister sites. And that for me was the most shocking thing, was just how graphic and how particularly the shootings in the woods, for example, around Riga on the Eastern <clears throat> Front, and the first references to the mobile gas trucks, which of course we didn't discover until after the liberation of the camps, but British intelligence knew already because they were overhearing it from the bug conversations and Hitler's stud farms, you know, the the beautiful Aryan girls that were had to sleep with SS officers and then the, as soon as the baby was born, the baby was taken away and they were known as the Lebensborn. It was the Lebensborn project and they didn't speak, these survivors, until the 1980s, that whole trauma. So there was a lot of stuff we picked up and also numbers by the middle of the war you know, some of those prisoners are, are boasting, oh, we've killed three and a half million Jews or five million, and they're arguing about it. And there is a query. The intelligence services aren't sure at that point how accurate the numbers are, but we now know in hindsight incredibly accurate. But what you hinted at, of course, was for 70 years, the German army, the Wehrmacht, had a clean bill of health. You know, it wasn't us. It was the SS. It was the death squads, etc., cetera, et cetera. But we now know from their admissions, and particularly the stuff from the generals at Trent Park, most of them, not all of them, but most of them were complicit in war crimes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's what shocked me, and it kind of dovetailed with the vanity of these people. They're not, not just saying, oh, yeah, I've heard about this. Some of them are saying, I actively participated in this. And, and that, I think, that really shocked me and it shocked me that they're having these conversations mm -hmm. but then they're complaining about not having enough cigars or german dentists or you know that that dissonance there i found really kind of shocking but so i mean it seems pretty clear that obviously the wehrmacht is hand in glove with the rest of the terror um is this information being passed up the chain of command do we have any sense of what the allies are doing you know, Churchill, Roosevelt, any of these people, what are they doing with this information? Or is that yet to be kind of uncovered? Or Yeah, I think there's still stuff that's being withheld because um, without going into detail, because I probably will write about it at some point when I can, there are a couple of secret operations potentially linked to MI9, actually, um, with regard to concentration camps. So the fact that the Allies did nothing, which is always what we've believed, is actually potentially not true. Um, and I have a couple of eyewitnesses from concentration camps as well, um, who said, you know, did we bomb the camps? Did we bomb the lines? Um, a couple of instances we did with a very, it backfires very interestingly. It's like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. But I don't think all the files have come out and I am still searching, but you've got a whisper that there's something there mm -hmm. uh, and of course until we took Italy you couldn't fly deep into enemy territory and back again so there's still mm -hmm. what this stuff throws up and I think very important for Holocaust education as well but what it throws up is that age-long question why didn't the Allies do anything if they knew this stuff well I would right. now raise the question did they and I, I'm not convinced right. they just sat back and did nothing and I think some of it is still classified they didn't totally stop it, of course, I understand that. Right, right, right. We, we, we have an, exp an explosion of questions and comments from our listeners. They're very excited about this. And I, I would uh, say, the, the, the one, one, just to clear one thing up, you've written two books about this, right? So Doug McCord asked about this. The M Room, that's the earlier book from eight or nine years ago when you first found out about it or putting it out there. And yeah. then the second book, which is the one that we're talking about today, uh, which is called, um, I, I just want to pop it up here, The Walls Have Ears, is the book with now with the additional information from having talked to people who worked there, having looked at the transcripts and all that. Is that, that's pretty, pretty much correct, right? Yes. So the M room is out of print now, but it is essentially, it's better to, if you've already got the M room, then the Walls Have Ears has masses of new stuff, critical analysis, which goes beyond because it is a journey. It was a journey for, for myself and for, you know, just a few secret listeners who were surviving. I also managed to 
interview intelligence personnel. By the way, with the exception of a lady who can't be interviewed anymore in Australia because uh, mentally deteriorated with Alzheimer's, we have no surviving veterans of this. Mm. One of the last surviving veterans, um, well, the last surviving secret listener passed away in December 2020, the 7th of December, I think the Times said the 6th, but it was actually the 7th. And then another intelligence officer passed away over the Christmas period, but you have to write the, read the book to find out who that was. <laughs> guest already. Well, good. <laughs> oh, By the way, great, great author promotion job. Right? Okay, <laughs> on all counts. That's like thing. Be that is the person who's written twenty five books and knows what she's doing, Chris. Chris, if we added our books together, we still One and get a half. The, we don't get to half of twenty five. I think we get to ten. I don't know, but uh, it's not twenty five. Read but. all of them. Uh, but, you know, I think that would be a very interesting. In fact, people might like that as a challenge. I put that out as a challenge. Um, see who you think the veteran is who passed away, uh, the last surviving, apart from the lady in Australia, the last surviving veteran passed away, it's in my book, well they were still alive when I wrote the book, but um, email me via my website. Well, I have a guess but I'm not going to say, so I'm, I'm going to leave it to be fair for everybody else. Chris, go ahead. So, I say, so Helen, one of the, one of the, um, one of the things that I find so um, moving or tragic about the story is you talk about how 1943 they have their this operation has gotten so large that they need more people to interpret and and take all this information down so kendrick turns to these jewish refugees who fled nazi germany they're serving in the pioneer corps and yeah. he begins to recruit from them and you have these people in the basement of this house taking down these conversations now they fled germany before it it got totally out of control and they're, and they're listening to these german officers talk about atrocities committed in their hometowns yeah god i mean and they can't do anything about it no, what did they say about that experience yeah i did ask them and they said you have to keep a professional distance yeah, most of them. I mean, there are, there are some exceptions where their families managed to get out, but the vast majority of them lost their families in the Holocaust. And they knew that they were listening to the stuff, uh, nothing they could have done. But of course, there was always that glimmer of hope that there might have been survivors. And at the end of the war, Kendrick Blessing gave them leave at different points to go and try, because many of them went to post-war Germany to do vital work with the army, intelligence work with the army. Um, and he gave them leave to go and try and find their relatives. But of course, the awful truth that they discovered, which they knew really. But interestingly, and you've probably picked this up as well, at the end of the war, after the liberation of Belsen, Kendrick insisted that every single one of those German generals watched film footage of the liberation of Belsen and we bugged their reactions. And of course, they said you know we didn't realize it was as bad as this or i didn't know about it but most of them you know began to talk amongst themselves how are we going to get off as war criminals will you cover for me and that kind of thing and fritz mm -hmm. lustig said to me when we ourselves are secret listeners and there were 103 german jewish secret listeners when we ourselves saw film footage of belson we didn't realize it was as bad as that we really we knew it was bad but even we were shocked and they'd, they'd seen a lot in Germany. In fact, we do, did have uh, listeners who survived Sachsenhausen, for example, so they'd seen quite a lot of brutality, but even they were shocked by those images of Belsen. It's, it's utterly horrifying. And I do remember, it's a memorable quote actually from General Felbert who says, we're disgraced for all time and not a thousand years is gonna wipe out what we've done. You know, he's one of the few that actually yeah. realizes the seriousness from the impact that, of that horrifying Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do the do the generals? So so we have had a couple of questions along this line. I'll put up Doreen's. You know, when did these guys find out it was all a ruse? I'm I'm going to guess they never did. Uh, but also, what happened to them in the post-war? So yeah, we never, we never, um, yeah, told them. They never found out. And I suppose, oops, forgot, forgot I, to mention it. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna. Uh, 
Well, there are a couple of theories. Of course, end of the Cold War, well, back then, uh, Berlin Wall's come down quite a while. You know, we were using the same operations, surprise, surprise, in the Cold War. And also, I think before the, you know, the last general had passed away, I think we couldn't release this stuff, but I haven't done a trace on every general when they passed away, but my sense is that's when they were finally released. So what happened to them? Well, they were eventually transferred bit by bit, or general by general, small groups of them, to Bridge End in Wales, Nissen huts with barbed wire. And <laughs> well, that's, that's sorry, cool. guys. <laughs> sorry, guys. So Field Marshal von Rundstedt is really cross about this, and he's like strutting around going, where's our luxury house gone? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> there are no microphones either. But it took two to three years to repatriate them. They had to go through a process of denazification, of education in democracy. Some of them, their homes were behind the Iron Curtain now, so they'd lost their homes. And, of course, because of all the hunt for war criminals, and they potentially you know, could be discovered. They Some of them lived under assumed names, but they quietly disintegrated into the society because they were not all dreams at Trent Park and all their plans to be back in power in post-war Germany. No way, because they realised they could face the noose if the war criminals trials, you know, got them. So... It's an interesting twist there, but they did think at one point that they were going to be back in power. And one of Kendrick's officers has written in the margin of the file, these guys, these guys are never getting back in power. And again, you get that sense of the intelligence services that absolutely no way were these guys going to ever get back into power. Well, one of the, you know, one of the things, again, that just, I don't know, it makes you want to scream when you're reading the book, is you have these German generals, German officers, on record, recorded, mm -hmm. saying, I committed this atrocity. Yeah. Uh, one of the ones that I that strikes me for some re some various reasons is Kurt Meyer. Kurt Meyer says, I went into that Russian village and I killed everybody. Yeah. The war crimes trials come after the war, and they don't use that information to prosecute these people. Why not? <laughs> yeah, 42,000 Jews of Lublin, they're, you know, they're, they're right. boasting about this stuff. Well, <clears throat> SS Kurt Meyer was tried. He's one of the few that was tried based on evidence not from Trent Park. So there right. are plenty of other evidence of Rostov and all that stuff. But it was a dilemma of intelligence. And one of the things <clears throat> excuse me, I uncovered was this really fierce debate within MI9, which is called an umbrella over this whole operation about whether to release this stuff and it was divided some of the intelligence chiefs wanted to release this stuff to nuremberg they did kind of pass the word through to nuremberg the prosecutors general so and so is known to have been here and committed atrocities they didn't say how see if you can get him to confess and if he didn't well then of course they were not and not a single german general was prosecuted from trent park for war crimes dilemma of intelligence we're entering a new war we're entering the Cold War. We can't admit to this stuff. The files are highly classified, run by a top secret branch of intelligence services, which back then officially didn't exist. We tend to forget that, don't we? You know, mm. MI5, MI6, MI9 was disbanded at the end of the war, but none of them officially existed until their official histories came out. And they said, oh, by the way, guys, we exist. Well, we all knew that. <laughs> but <they'd> never... <laughs> we really, we exist. Yeah, we all knew what happened. So again, I think we do forget that. We take it for granted today. We have a couple of, uh, uh, we're not gonna to get to all the questions we have, but a couple of people have asked sort of uh, uh, something we've touched on. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Wallace Morrison put it this way, how much of the atrocity information was reported to Churchill? Uh, and, and again, and I guess this is a way of asking, um, you know, uh, sort of the Howard Baker question from Watergate, how much did we know, you know, and when did we know it? I mean, how much did Churchill know about the Holocaust? Was he, did he know stuff that he then was suppressing or, you know, what's the story? Yeah, it's not so much that he's suppressing it because don't forget there are lots of sources for some of the stuff on the Holocaust, including stuff being smuggled out from the camps. They're picking up stuff from Bletchley Park 
from the police traffic in uh, Russia on the Eastern Front. So uh, that's 1941. And so we're picking it up from different areas, but these top secret sections like Bletchley Park, the units like Bletchley Park, like Trent Park and its sister sites, um, that stuff you know, couldn't be made publicly available. But there was, in December 1942, uh, a couple of moments of silence for victims of the Holocaust in the Houses of Parliament and a speech if, uh, the same day Winston Churchill's wife gives a very important speech. If I'm not mistaken, it was at the Anglo-Palestine Association, as it then was. So a lot of stuff was known, but what is unquestionable is the fact that the detail and the depth of what they're picking up the conversations wasn't known in the public domain, but it was certainly known to Churchill. But of course, he couldn't use it because it's a top secret unit. I mean, occasionally he, he slipped very close to re revealing some of the stuff. And so they decided not to show him everything. I'm not just saying about Trusted, <laughs> don't show him this because he might leak it to Parliament. So, well, Helen, before I go on, I just want to say, if we post your website on our website, can people ask you questions that we don't get to? Because yeah. we're getting so many questions that I'm sure, you know, they would like to. Or they can buy the book. Well, of course they're going to buy I just want to mention I, you can buy the book. The walls have ears. Helen, you're not upset if people yeah, buy the book, uh, right? Well, the point is, I, I've got a deal. If you buy the book and read it and you've still got questions, then email me because I've, there you go. I've got, I'm Boom. about to do the proofs of my next book, which you've awesome. got to enjoy. We will. <laughs> well. I've, I've got to get to that, otherwise you'll have nothing else to read. Oh, right. Well, okay. So You get a last I, question, though, Chris, if you want. I put my foot in my mouth there. All right. Well, fine. No, that's um, it's all right. You're all so, good. So, <laughs> um, the war ends, you know, um, and the and the... The work gets out about Bletchley Park, and they make movies about it, and it's famous, and everybody knows about it. This is still relatively unknown. And and mm -hmm. so, kind of two questions. Uh, one is, do the veterans that worked in this operation, did they ever have a sense of, like, hey, you know, we were there, too, and we were kind of doing, we were part of all this. Did they feel that, you know, how do they feel about that? Uh, and also, BBC has said that Bletchley Park shortens the war by two to four years. And it kind of in your professional opinion, how much did Trent Park shorten the war? I think it's hard to say because I know Bletchley Park now is trying to move away from the idea that it shortened the war by two oh, yeah, years. Oh, yeah, but it just... years, it's not very kind of, uh, it's a kind of not the thing at the moment. It's hard to say what I will say because making a judgment, like that, so I absolutely think that in 1943 we would have lost the war without it. And why? Because I've uncovered new stuff. And I'm sorry about this, guys. I don't normally do this, but it's in my neck. It's okay. Book. No, absolutely. Everybody, put your hands over your ears. Now, Helen, you just tell us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Wow! <laughs> and what was, your, yeah, what was your other question about... What did the people that worked there feel oh, yes. about kind of the, the lack of attention on, on what they've done? Well, of course, none of them got any recognition because it's top-secret work. Right. And when I got to it, I only interviewed half a dozen secret listeners. All the rest had died. So most of them, well, they did. Mm, the vast majority of the personnel knew. went to their graves carrying their secrets. And those closest to Kendrick would have, would have known the impact of what they'd done. However, mm. the secret listeners and German Jewish refugee women as well working at this site, not as listeners, but in other roles, that's it, lovely, um, you know, they were told it was important, but they never understood. And, you know, Fritz said when we launched the Emram all those years ago, he said publicly, and it was very moving. He said, you know, I've spent the last 70 years feeling guilty for having had a safe war. He said, I lost comrades on the battlefields, friends, British and refugee friends. <clears throat> and he said, I felt guilty. And he said, now I can be proud of what I've done. It's quite, you know, it's really moving. And his wife also worked with him at the site. Yeah. What more can you say? I really wished those other personnel could have understood just how significant. And, you know, a lot of those papers, they're so dense, the conversations, it's really hard to get the story out of it. And if it hadn't been for Fritz... I think I might have given up. You pull up these volumes of conversations yeah. and files, massive stuff. What you do with it, 
But I promised him, I said to him, yeah, look, but I'll get to it and I'll do it. And we did. It was a journey together with some other secret listeners. So, well, yeah. We're very glad you did. That, yeah. But Helen, so thank you. No. Thank well, you. We've for... got to be the guardians of that legacy, actually. Well, we'll keep an eye on the new stuff that you have, and then we'll try to readjust our view of World War II based on what you come up with. I think we better be ready for that. I want to thank you for joining us. Somebody asked if you can visit Trent Park today. It, you can't, but maybe soon, right? That's the. We, there's no. I mean, you can. There's no museum there now, but perhaps something that's in the future. Um, 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 I think and, people will just have to Google that. I'm not involved in the yeah, museum at Trent right. Park, but they, okay. can, they can Google. Yes, yeah, so you can walk can around the building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, and best of luck to you. We really appreciate it. Thank you thank so you. much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Buy the book, guys. Yeah, buy the book. Um, wow. Okay. We had some technical difficulties at the beginning there, but uh, that was we truly overcame. awesome. Truly yes, awesome. It was. And I want to just mention, Chris, that next week we are going to get in our time machine and go back uh, 1,800 years or so. And we are going to talk about Pertinax, the son of a slave who became the Roman emperor. And our guest is historian, archaeologist, and author Simon Elliott. And we'll talk about Pertinax and his time. He's about 200 years after Julius Caesar. Uh, and also, uh, I just thought this was interesting. He pops up in some weird places, Chris. Uh, so Machia yes. Machiavelli mentions Pertinax in his Ooh. writings. And, uh, and he comes up in the Virginia Ratification Convention for the U.S. Constitution. That old Pertinax. He makes his That old Pertinax. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're really glad to have you guys here. Be safe. Thank <music> you.